Hey guys, this is Eckhart Slatter. Hello and welcome to another Star Wars Legends lore video. Before we begin, special thank you to Corey for helping me come up with the idea for today's video. This was one that he had on the back burner basically, and I was like, hey, what should I do today? And he suggested it. So if you enjoy this video, consider going over to his page and dropping a subscription. Corey, in my opinion, is probably the best Star Wars Legends YouTuber, and his channel, Corey's Datapad, needs a lot more subscribers. He also makes the Thrones Revenge mod, if you want to follow that, along with some other stuff over on his gaming channel, Corey Loses. So today we'll be talking about probably my favorite piece of Star Wars content, The Essential Guide to Warfare, which was a Star Wars Legends reference book, basically detailing the entirety of history with a focus of course on warfare. And in that book, we get an incredibly interesting prologue, which details the execution of Imperial Grand Admiral Oswald Teshik. Teshik was notable not only for being one of the Empire's 12 Grand Admirals, but for his last stand at Endor, where he stayed fighting even after the Imperial fleet retreated and managed to hold out in four hours in his Star Destroyer. The prologue of the book is actually a transcript of the statement he made before being executed for war crimes by the New Republic. It details basically how Palpatine became unhappy with the Grand Admiral, and punished him by sending him into the Hapes Consortium with a small fleet of ships knowing that he would meet his doom. The Hapens were well known for zealously protecting their borders, as we learn in, for example, the courtship of Princess Leia. Anyway, Teshik arrives within the Hapes Consortium, and his small task force is absolutely devastated by a Hapen fleet. Somehow, as Teshik's command ship was destroyed, and he was ejected into the vacuum of space, he managed to get himself into a life support suit, which allowed him to survive the initial blast, although the suit unfortunately was ruptured. As he's dying in the void, with the Hapen fleet having jumped away, he experiences an incredibly interesting vision. I didn't lose consciousness, I could still think and see, but I was no longer seeing what was around me or hearing the hiss of my ruined suit. I had a vision. I was shown everything at once, everything that had been and everything that will be. I saw great beings made of light, who could be everywhere and nowhere at once. They were vaster than nebula and tinier than cells, and they assembled solar systems like children with toys. I saw strange ships made of whirling, tumbling rods and cones, and heard them scream and moan as they shuddered by. I saw great chrome warships whose mirrored hulls turned sunlight into blinding sheets, and black battleships whose spines were crowned with terrible spiked cathedrals. I saw hammerhead battle cruisers burning in slab-sided Mandalorian constructs sparkling with rime. I saw star destroyers arrowing through the night, and blistered Mon Calamari cruisers schooling, and fighters of all shapes and sizes swarming. I saw ships that seemed built from clumps of multicolored wire, and ones that looked like organs torn from living things. And I knew all these ships were filled with beings whose lives had been given to war. All at once I understood that those of us born to be sacrificed upon the pyre of war became one when we die, mingled smoke, gone up to whatever gods you believe in, for they are the ones who created war, and they breathed it into our hearts when they created us. Eventually the Grand Admiral was saved, Palpatine had a stealth ship in the area watching the battle unfold, and recovered him in his torn suit. He would survive, but would need extensive cybernetic enhancement. That's not really important though. He continues with his vision, saying he knew what had come to pass, the Emperor's demise, the Death Star's ruin. Then he teases the New Republic with what's to come. Shall I tell you what else I saw? Things that are yet to be? I think you will, because you won't believe me anyway. I saw ruined towers on Coruscant, overtopped by curtains of spiked green and purple. I saw the forests of Kashyyyk burning, and the seas of Mon Calamari boiling, and planets ripped in two by the fiery lances of super lasers yet to be built, and other things I'll take with me into the vanishing. So wow, there's a lot to discuss here, and let's first break down the vision that he talks about early on. We have great beings of light. I'm gonna come back to that one. Then a description of ships in conflicts, which are actually told chronologically. Strange ships made of whirling, tumbling rods and cones refers to Rakatan warships, and of course the Rakata were the dominant civilization after the Celestials. I saw great chrome warships whose mirrored hulls turned sunlight into blinding sheets. Those would be Tyanese warships, and as Cory pointed out to me, a good example of that would be the Zalachai Dreadnought, which was used by Zim the Despot. Black battleships with terrible spiked cathedrals on their spines would refer to the ships 
ships of the Pious Dea, and Hammerhead Battlecruisers is obviously Hammerhead warships, with slab-sided Mandalorian contracts being Mandalorian warships. Then, Star Destroyers airwing through the night, and blistered Mon Calamari cruisers refers of course to the Galactic Civil War. Then we move into the future. Ships that seem built from clumps of multicolored wire actually refers, according to Jason Fry himself, to the warships of the Nagai, a species which invaded the galaxy right after the Battle of Endor. The warships were actually made by the Faroon, which were another species from the galaxy that the Nagai came from. I've covered all that in prior videos. And organs torn from living things refers to the Yuzhan Vong. This is clearly more than insanity, as Teshik accurately describes elements of both the past and the future. More of the future later on can actually be traced to individual events. We have, for example, the Yuzhan Vong taking of Coruscant when he discusses curtains of spiked green and purple. We also have the bombing of Kashyyyk mentioned directly, and I guess there's a variety of events that could be the Sea of Mon Calamari boiling. But I assume that's the Mon Calamari genocide from the Legacy Era. Planets being ripped into by super lasers yet to be built could refer to anything. Perhaps Jason knew about Starkiller Base in 2012 when he wrote the book, but probably not. But what's really interesting is that there are other things I'll take with me into the vanishing. Either way, this whole vision ties back to what he talks about at the very beginning. It's thousands and thousands of years of endless warfare, cyclical, with trillions upon trillions of beings being killed. He talks about how war seems to be at the heart of sentient species. He says, For they, whatever gods you believe in, are the ones who created war, and they breathed it into our hearts when they created us. He's probably being figurative and just talking about how it's in man and, I guess, aliens in nature to fight, but we also get, from his perspective, a description of the Celestials. The Celestials were an extremely ancient race in Star Wars. They predated all known alien species, and they were extremely powerful. They made things like Centerpoint Station, they assembled star systems at their whim, and performed other feats of engineering on a vast scale. I saw great beings made of light, who could be everywhere and nowhere at once. They were vaster than nebula and tinier than cells, and they assembled solar systems like children with toys. This showed me that the Celestials reach beyond a level that we've even recognized. They've probably abandoned their physical forms almost entirely, and can seemingly manipulate the galaxy at will. And there is a bit of confusion here, because a lot of people believe that the Mortis Ones are Celestials, but if you read Fate of the Jedi, that's clearly not true. They're sort of like Celestials, but there's some key distinctions here. We get the following quote from Fate of the Jedi Apocalypse. Reinar turned back to Thirut and asked, what are these three beings? Celestials? Thirut shivered her antenna. Celestials are in the Force, she said. The Ones are what Celestials become. It's really unclear what's going on here. Everything about the Ones is really mysterious, and Thirut is a killick, and they basically pass on memories somewhat unreliably through a sort of shared memory. But the basic explanation is that the Celestials are sort of the Force itself, and that the Ones are physical aspects of that in a way. Even Thirut recognizes that it's almost impossible to explain, saying, We do not know how to explain the Celestials any better. They are beyond the understanding of mortals. Interestingly, Fate of the Jedi, especially the latter half of the series, it talks about many of the same themes as the prologue. One of those is basically how the galaxy is in an unending state of war, but also that war and the combat between the light and the dark side also somewhat cleanse the galaxy. It's very confusing, especially when Abeloth is sort of involved as a bringer of chaos. Then Anakin killed the Ones in the Clone Wars, and it's just a mess, and I've really got to reread Fate of the Jedi before I even try to go more in depth than that. But it's interesting that the description of the Celestials here seems to line up generally with what the Killicks remember. Why did Tesha get this last message before nearly dying to the Void? Well, it's hard to say. Maybe he was somewhat force sensitive. Maybe there's something in that part of space within the Hapes Cluster. Maybe there was some greater force reaching out to him before death. Death. Maybe that's what all things see before dying. It's hard to say, but in my opinion, it's one of the most interesting stories in Star Wars Legends, especially given its relatively brief word count. And I highly recommend you guys to check out The Essential Guide to Warfare. This is within the first 10 pages, and there's a lot more stuff in that book that's really worth going over. Also, a special thank you again to Corey for suggesting this video idea to me. A link to all of his stuff up below and also down in the description. So, thanks for watching, guys. As always, this has been Eckhart's Ladder. Have a great one, and may the Force be with you.